the, this next uh, segment of our lectures today is on um, why socialism failed. And the subtitle is The Ethical and Economic uh, Bankruptcy of uh, Government Planning. And uh, this is a very tragic story. Uh, because as I'm going to say here, trying to make a material heaven on earth led to a human hell. Uh, when the 20th century began, uh, that is a little over 100 years ago, one of the great movements that was seen to be gaining momentum in many places in the world was socialism. The idea that capitalism would re be replaced by an economic system, a social system, a political system, implicitly also a moral system, that supposedly would transcend self-interest, uh, do away with greed, eliminate the profit motive. Uh, all people would be sharing in a common community of, of production for the common good, for the general welfare. Uh, resources would no longer be in private hands. Uh, as, as a caretaker of the people as the whole, government would nationalize the means of production and manage the economy, not for profit, as the socialists used to say, but for use. And it was believed that by, by during the century that has just passed, the triumph of socialism over capitalism would not only give people more freedom, but would give them a standard and a quality of life far beyond everything that they have known. The tragedy of the last hundred years has been that instead of this paradise on earth, socialism resulted in a hell on earth. And let's start off by just looking at the human cost of building socialism during the last 100 years. In the Soviet Union, from the time of the Russian Revolution of 1917 until 1986, just a few years before the formal end of the Soviet Union as a political entity on the map of the world, uh, historians have estimated, based upon uh, uh, partly open, so formerly Soviet secret archives, the secret police, the government, that in the name of building socialism, the regime killed unarmed, innocent men, women, and children in the number of 68 million people. Enemies of the revolution, uh, 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 capitalist exploiters, uh, uh, wreckers who are not enthusiastic enough about the new socialist world. All of these people were killed. How were they killed? In some cases, for example, in the years immediately after uh, the, the communist revolution, uh, socialist revolution in the Soviet Union, it is estimated that 20,000 priests were killed. Obviously, the Russian, that, that would be the Russian Orthodox Church but it's estimated that 20,000 priests were killed. Why? Because they were, 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 were undermining uh, the, the new world of, of, you know, religion is an opiate of the masses, religion is a false god, uh, 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 socialists in their revolutions usually were atheists, were going to build a scientific society and do away with superstition, and to do away with the superstition of religion, we eradicate those who try to convert people to this this false belief, and so they killed over 20,000 priests in the Soviet Union of the Russian Orthodox Church. They rounded up those who were businessmen and, uh, and seized their property and sent them off into slave labor camps in Siberia. For example, my wife is Russian. We met in Moscow. Um, while they were still a Soviet Union, I was, in the last years of the Soviet Union, I was traveling there quite frequently doing consulting work on market reform and privatization. And on one of these trips, I, I met uh, my, uh, my future wife at a conference, an econ uh, a political sort of cultural conference. Anyway, uh, her grandfather had been a businessman <coughs> back in the 1920s in Russia. And in the late 1920s, when they started finishing the full confisca confiscation of all private enterprise, uh, they not only seized, the government nationalized her grandfather's uh, businesses, but he was arrested and he spent over, t over ten, th 10 years in the Soviet slave labor camp systems uh, of Siberia. And she tells me that when she was a, a little girl, uh, after he had been released from the camps, uh, she would go visit her grandparents in, uh, in the town where they lived in, 
um, in more southern European Russia, a town called Rostov, and she, t she would tell me that, that when she was a little girl, she was afraid of her grandfather. The reason was his face was severely deformed from the beatings during the interrogations in the labor camps. And he would talk very loud because he was deaf. And why was he deaf? Because as part of the torture and the interrogation sessions, they had hammered nails into his ears. Now that, 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 that's just one personal story. This was done it is estimated that over 20 million people went through the la slave labor camps of, of the Soviet Union, particularly under Stalin in the 1930s and 40s and early 1950s. Up to 20 million people went through this meat grinder of slave labor camps in the harsh we weather conditions of Siberia. Some people being sent to work in uranium mines with no thought of whether they would get radioactive poisoning. One bunch of dead slave laborers will be replaced by another. Okay. The farmers in Russia, the peasants as they were called, did not want to have their farms being be taken over. In the early 1930s, Stalin had decided that he was going to collectivize all the land. People are going to be put into government-owned and managed collective farms, which means all the private farmers have to give up their private farms. And the peasants didn't want to. These, these were le small farms that had been in their families for generations and generations and generations. And they resisted joining these government-owned collective farms. And so what did Stalin do? He imposed a forced famine. He cut off all food. He, 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 had, he had the secret police and the military go in and take away all the food supplies from these, from these private farming areas. And then he put a cauldron around, cauldron around these areas of, poli of army units to prevent anyone trying to escape or anyone trying to bring in food for relatives who lived in the rural areas, causing a human-created mass famine. And it is estimated that between 1930 and 1934, during this campaign to force the private farmers to give up their land, as many as 9 to 12 million people were starved to death to force them to go into these collective government farms. Nine to 12 million people. There's a, there's a, a book about that episode by an historian named Robert Conquest. It's called The Harvest of Sorrow. The Harvest of Sorrow. <coughs> they would have quotas. Right? Under government planning, you have like five-year plans. You have qu quotas for production. They had quotas to round up people to execute or send to, labor la to slave labor camps. Children were expected to inform on their parents that they heard something at home. And the parents would then be arrested because of the child informing on the parents. It was a, a madhouse. 68 million innocent, unarmed men, women, and children killed, either worked to death, starved to death, tortured to death, just shot. All in the name of building this future society of a perfect utopia on heaven on earth. Mao's China, from the time that the communists came to power in China, the communists came to power on the mainland of China in 1949 till 1976, when Mao died, Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao, it's estimated that China is still technically a communist country. Their files and archives and documents and records are still sealed, controlled by the communist government. But Chinese and Western historians, to the best that they can make estimates, 80 million people died under Mao. Again, in the name of building this... Uh, so, uh, enemies of the people, enemies of the state, evil capitalists, children of the enemies of the state. Also, that because of, of misguided government uh, planning and direction in the economy, there, there, there was a, a, a huge famine in China as well. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, during an attempt to modernize overnight called the Great Leap Forward. And it's estimated that 20 million people died in this forced famine as government was trying to force industrialization and taking resources and people away from farming. Not enough food was growing, 20 million. In fact, the, uh, the records of, of the people who survived this have brought out that it was so, 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 so desperate 
that it resulted in cannibalism. People whose small children died, it was too gruesome to eat your own children to stay alive. So you trade your, the body of your dead child for the body of your neighbor's dead child, so at least you weren't eating your own son or daughter. This went on. This went on. Th th these are records of people's you know, lives. Nazi Germany. It's worth recalling that. What is the word Nazi for? It's a shortage of the official name of Hitler's party. The National Socialist Workers Socialist Party. Nationalsozialismus in German. National Socialist Workers Party. The Nazis were as socialist as the communists. It's just that the communists talk about international socialism. <laughs> And the Nazis talk about national socialism based upon the, their notions of right master, uh, master race, right national socialism, race socialism. But they're the only difference. And it's, esti and it's estimated that 25 million people died because of the Nazis in Europe. And th this isn't the war combat despion between armies during World War II. These are innocent men, women, and children. In this case, destroyed because they were viewed as inferior races, right? I'm sure all of us are six million Jews, but it wasn't just six million Jews. It's three million Poles, right? The Slavic peoples were considered inferiors by the Nazis as well. So three million Poles were killed. Half a million Gypsies. Ten million Russians and Ukrainians, right? Because the, the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union. They overran a good part of European Russia. And, and, and it's estimated they killed, again, innocent men, women, and children. Ten million Russians and Ukrainians for the, during their occupation. Mass murders. And then just, just this one other, just to give an, an, an Cambodia, the little country in Southeast Asia next to Vietnam, uh, squeezed between Vietnam and Thailand. Well, the, they were, there was a communist movement there called the Khmer Rouge, the Red Cambodians. And they were in power for just about three years, 1976 to 1979. It's estimated that in this approximately three year period, they killed 2.5 uh, million people. Now you might say, what, what, why are you even listing them? You know, 68 million in the Soviet Union, 80 million possibly under Mao, 25 million by National Socialist Germany, the Nazis. Uh, 2.5, that's like the miscellaneous column. You won't even miss them compared to these big numbers. Why list them? Because as a percentage of a population, as a percentage of a population, this is probably the hugest mass murder of the 20th century because the entire population of Cambodia was only about six million. So this is killing about a third of everybody in the country. Okay, think about this. One, two, three, you're dead. One, two, three, you're dead. One, two, three, you're dead. Again, enemies of the people, op opponents of the socialist utopia. What could get you killed? You wore glasses. That could get you killed. Wear glasses. You're in trouble. Take them off. Now, why? <laughs> You're in the same boat. <laughs> why? Yeah, you say, what the hell? What do you mean? You're going to kill people because they wear glasses. Ah, this was the thinking of the Khmer Rouge, these red communists, okay? This is what their thinking was. If you wore glasses, you probably could read. And who, how would you have learned to read? Well, if you recall a little bit of history, Cambodia, along with Vietnam and Laos, had been a French colony, French Indochina. Well, you must have learned to read from French teachers, or after the French left, from Americans who came, right? English. So if you could read French or English, you have read the evil bourgeois capitalist literature. Your brain has been infected by bad capitalist bourgeois ideas. Better to exterminate you so we can get rid of the infection to build the new socialist utopia for a new generation. Okay, 2.5, 2.5. What they would do when they, after they executed you, often with torture leading to, the, to your death, they would take your body and they would throw it into boiling water so that the flesh was melted away and all that was left with is the, the skeleton. And what would they do? They would take the skulls and make them into little pyramid mountains to put along the roads as warnings to others in society to not challenge the authority of the communist officials. 
there is actually a movie about this. It's called The Killing Fields. It was made back in the 1980s. Uh, there was a Cambodian journalist who was working with a New York Times correspondent when the communists took over Cambodia in this. And uh, the New York Times reporter got out, but his Cambodian colleague could not. And he endured this for most of these three years, finally able to escape to Thailand after being in a labor camp, worked uh, practically to a death to a, from starvation condition. He escaped to Thailand, contacted his former friend and colleague from the New York Times, who arranged for him to come to the US as a political asylum. And after coming to the United States, he wrote this book of his, of his personal experience under this, this horrific regime. And the book is called The Killing Fields, but they did make it into a movie, which you, I guess you can rent or, or streaming on Netflix or something. I don't know, maybe it's streaming, I don't know. But certainly you, could, you can rent the movie. It's, it, uh, is, is, is it a happy-go-lucky comedy musical? Obviously not. But it, it tells you about a real episode of the inhumanity of what people can do to each other. We can be very cruel to our fellow human beings and guided by these ideas of making new worlds, new utopias, regardless of the human cost. Regardless of the human cost. I have been to both Nazi concentration camps, which are often you know, preserved as museums, and I have actually had an opportunity to, to go through and see one of the KGB headquarters in, 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 in the Soviet Union. And I can assure you, the Nazis and the communists were exactly the same, of how they would put you through a treadmill leading from your arrest, your inter interrogation, and your death. How so? Well, they would first arrest you, and they would take you and strip you naked. And they would put you into this little cab or closet room in total darkness, right? This is all psychological, right? You're naked and you're in the dark. You know, this, right, right? psychological intimidation. Then they take you into the room where they would interrogate you, you know, get information out of you, whether there was any information to get out, get out of you or not, right? And they would proceed to torture you, to get you to confess to whatever they wanted you to confess to. And assuming that you didn't die right then, they would say, well, we're transporting you to another facility. But of course, before we transport, we, ha we have to have a doctor examine you. So you'd be taken to, into this little room, you know, your, 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 your blood pressure, your heart rate. Oh, we have to measure you. And so they, they'd put you up against the wall against, uh, where there was a meter stick, right, to measure your height. But the fact is, behind the meter stick was a little cabinet room with a trap door. And while you're standing to be measured, the trap door would be hope, open behind you and you'd be shot in the back of the neck. Mm. Now this is how both the Nazis and the communists would do this. I saw this in these two locations. Now what was, then, then, you would be, then your body would be taken to, to another room where you'd be put on a metal slab and if there was any gold in your teeth, they would be extracted. And then what would they do with your body? Well, the only difference between the Nazis and the communists is the communists would just take your body and the bodies of other people and throw them into nameless mass graves. The Nazis would throw your body into an oven and burn you to ashes before they buried the ashes. That was the difference between them. Do they burn your body before you bury you in this nameless grave or not? That's the only difference between the communists and the Nazis. Their methods were practically carbon copies of each other, which perhaps itself is telling you something about the two systems. But this is, this is what this regime, these regimes created. The human cost of this. What is, just think of the immorality of this to view other human beings as mere pawns on a chessboard to just do what you want with. To move them about, to command them to work, to send them to labor camps, to crush and throw and dispose of you, the pawn. Terrible, horrific experience. The nightmare of trying to build this utopian socialism, of socialism. Now, you, we must understand that this type of absolute power of government was likely to inevitably follow from the nature of the system they set up. If government owns all the means of production, it nationalizes the industry, it nationalizes and takes over all the land, it nationalizes and takes over all the resources and raw materials of the society, 
then the government becomes the ultimate monopolist, does it not? It's the only game in town. There's nobody else to work for. There's no one else to supply you with goods and services. There's no one else to turn to for any information. It is why, when you look at the histories of these socialist countries of the 20th century, invariably, they represented systems of total control, not just of people and lives, but of all information. What, what freedom of speech can there be? What freedom of press can there be? When all the printing presses are owned by the government. And the printing presses are only used to pr publish government-owned newspapers. Then the only news that gets in the newspaper is what the government wants you to read. Let's suppose that you, you, you're religious, you have a faith. You want to get together with those of, of a similar faith and to share you know, the, a communion in your faith as a congregation. Well, if the government owns all the land, how do you get access to land to build a church or a synagogue or, 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 or a mosque? How do you do this? You can't. The government has to decide whether it's going to allocate you the land. And even it says, well, sure, you can have that land for your church or your synagogue or your mosque. But guess what? We're tied up with other things the government assigns more important in terms of the people's, the government's construction company. So the resources and the construction facilities to build the place of worship, I'm sorry, it's not part of our plan. So how do you have a church? This is different than in the market, right? You want to you you come together and <coughs> build a, a church? No problem. You buy the land from someone. If you and the people of the similar faith are willing to pull some dollars together and, and buy the land from the owner, you then hire a private construction company, having, again, because you value the sharing of your faith, you put your money together to hire a construction company to build the building. You put air conditioning in, you put heating in. Well, here you don't need heating, I guess, ever. Occasionally, I assume you occasionally need a fan or something, you know, it gets hot. Okay. <laughs> but you, you, you buy it, you, you put in air conditioning, you buy, you buy some fans. I mean, because there are private people who sell these. They don't care about your religion. Right? They don't care. In the you know, people often say the market is crass. It's corrupt. All that counts is your money. You know something? That's wonderful. When you, last time you went into the market and pulled a can of corn or beans or something or a soup off the shelf, did you say, well, I don't know if I want to buy this. What were the political or religious views of the person who manufactured it? You don't care. You don't know them. All you're interested in is, is this a product that I'm interested in buying in the qualities I'm looking for at a price that I'm willing to pay. The seller is anonymous. He could hold religious views, political views, social views that you would either agree with or f would find abhorrent. It doesn't matter. In the market, exchange is based upon willingness to pay and willingness to sell. And based upon the incomes we earn, we are then private individuals who can proceed to use the income we've earned by serving our fellow citizens in the way I explained in this division of labor to pursue the values, purposes, goals, beliefs that we have whether others agree with them or not. It is the anonymity of the market. It is the merely money nature of a market economy that gives us the freedom not to have the approval of our fellow citizens to live the lives that we want. You know, you, you, you hear about these, like these, these people who are into quote, quote, gothic, right? They dress in black and wear, 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 wear weird things and I don't know, I'm not into that weird stuff <laughs> but I mean it doesn't you know, you want to you want to have an apartment or a house and paint every wall black right you know these gothic stuff that's your business it's your house it's your apartment you earn the money and people who might say what kind of weirdos are these gothic people I mean who cares it doesn't matter they sold you they that person sold you a product you wanted to buy at a price you were willing to pay and then with the income that they earned they live the way they want it gives that, that anonymity, it gives you freedom <coughs> from the fru approval or the condemnation of your fellow man. <coughs> so you live your way, you have your faith, you have your belief, you have your non-belief. The market exchanges allow all of the things that we value, whether all of our neighbors agree with us or not, to be able to be fulfilled if we're willing to devote the time and the money to pursue the things that we value and consider important.
But when the state owns the land, when the state owns the resources, when the state owns the, the, the machinery, when the state is the only, only employer, then what you, what you do is determined by the state. Where you live is determined by the state. What things you have access to is determined by the state. What values and purposes you can pursue is confined and dictated by the state. You can only live in the Soviet Union where, where the government told you to live. Under the government planning of everything, they determined where you worked because they're the only employer, which also meant they determined whether you got to go to college or university and what you were allowed to study according to their planning of what they needed and wanted. So now you graduate and you're assigned to work in, 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 in government factory or industry X located in some city. Well, where are you going to live? Well, the government is the only one that builds housing. Government apartment buildings. And they assign you the neighborhood and the actual apartment. And you can't live any other place. You are registered by the state. That is the state assigned apartment, which you may not sell because it's not yours. And you can't move because you have no right to. And that was in your internal passport. We think of external passports, right? You want to travel to the US or I travel here. Everyone in the Soviet Union had an internal passport, which had name, gender, place of birth, education, religious background, if any, nationality. And this went through, this followed you your entire life, and then also your residency permit. In Russian, it was called propiska, your residency permit. And that, and that in your internal passport, it was like, you have to show your documents, your papers, to any official, from the local policeman on the beat to the secret police who might stop you for some reason. You had to have that. And that specified everything. Where you worked, where you lived. And you want a promotion, you better ha have the approval of the fellow above you in the state enterprise. Because if he gives you a bad mark, forget about any promotion. Because you, you, there's no like private employer that you could say, well, you know, he was a rat, a lousy person, I want a job. There is no other employer, because it's another state enterprise, and the record follows you all through the bureaucracy. This is the nature of this system. Totally controlled, totally dominated by the nature of this institutional system. Because when, with socialism means the government is the owner of all. And if the government is the owner of all, as I say, it's the only employer, the only producer, and it determines what you're apportioned and allocated. Your life fate is in the hands of those who control you in the political structure and in the bureaucracy. What happens to freedom then? What happens to choice then? What happens to just trying to live your life as you want to then? Everyone was a puppet at the end of the strings of those who had political control and power. And this was the pattern <coughs> followed in every socialist country, whether the Soviet Union or China or those Eastern Bloc countries under the communists such as Poland and Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania and so on. Vietnam, or even today, North Korea, or Cuba. Like Cuba's next door, right? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I hate to tell you this, it's a commie country. The government still controls the, new, the media. The government still controls production. The government still controls, right? You say something the government doesn't like? You're going to get a one-way ticket to that little island south of Maine, Cuba, the Isle of Pines. That's where their, their political prisoner prisons are. Okay? It can be for political opposition. It can be for religious persecution reasons. A whole variety of things. It's a controlled society. Oh, but everyone has free education in Cuba. Yeah. The only thing you learn is what the government wants you to learn. They teach you to read so you can read their propaganda. And therefore, they control you through mind control. 
but it's free health care. Yeah, you get the medical treatment that the government decides that you shall have, not the one that you'd like or prefer. But the government guarantees a job, yeah. In this situation that you work where the government tells you what the pay the government says you're going to have. To have all of these securities and guarantees has a price. As I mentioned last night in one of my comments, anything that the government says it's going to do for you inevitably carries with it the necessity for the government to do t things to you. What are they going to do to you? This is where you'll work. This is where you'll live. This is the information you'll have access to. This is the education we'll decide you have, both form and content. Because there's no other game in town. That was the political reality. What, what type of, of a system is it in which everyone is at the, manipul at the manipulated control of those in political power? What's ethical about such a system? What's moral about such a system? I would suggest very little. Compared to a market economy, which I was explaining in some of my remarks last night especially, it is inherently a system of dignity and respect. Because you are a free person. You own yourself. You can't be coerced. You can't be compelled. Human relationships are supposed to be based upon freedom of choice and voluntary agreement and mutual consent. Where the state is the controller, they need to show ne you neither dignity or respect because you have no choice but to obey. Now, if those are the aspects, the economic, the political and social aspects of the attempt to build socialism, it also failed, let me suggest, as an economic system. Socialist central planning does away with all the market institutions through which rational production decisions can be made. And what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Well, let's remember what we spoke about in the previous lecture. Okay? Let's remember what we spoke about in the previous lecture. In a market economy, there is private property. And therefore, people can buy and sell things. And through the buying and selling of things, they express to each other, as sellers and demanders, the value that they place upon the goods that they would desire or could manufacture. Okay? It is through prices we saw that we communicate with each other. We determine what consumers value, as expressed in their demands and the prices they're willing to pay. On the supply side, businessmen, enterprises, entrepreneurs are competing against each other. For what? the hire, the purchase, the use, the employment, the renting of labor, machines, tools, equipment, resources, raw materials. And prices emerge out of those competitive bids of rivalrous businessmen, each of whom want to acquire these factors of production to make their particular pro different products. And we have the prices of, of, of the factors of production. And we saw that enterprises, entrepreneurs, businessmen, can then compare the selling price that the consumers might be willing to pay with the cost or input prices of what it would uh, cost to hire, purchase, use, rent, employ the factors of production for the comparison of profit or loss. And it is these prices that give direction and rationality to the entire aspects of what goes on in the market. 
Indeed, that is what, as I tried to explain in the previous lecture, how there is a successful matching and coordinating of what multitudes of now billions do in this global economy. The problem is, is that what socialism as an economic system did was to do away with the very institutions through which this type of interpersonal communication through prices is possible. Because you see, if the government owns all of the factors of production loans, all the resources of the society, then clearly there is nothing privately to buy and sell. Now if there's nothing privately to buy and sell, then individuals have no motives or incentives to offer each other bargains or, or, or negotiations. If there's nothing to buy and sell, then there's no bids and offers. If there's no bids and offers, there's no higgling and haggling of the marketplace. If there's no higgling and haggling of the marketplace, there's no agreed upon terms of, of trade. If there are no agreed upon terms of trade, you know, so many apples for so many bananas, right? The agreed <coughs> upon terms of trade. If there's no agreed upon terms of trade, then there's no prices. And if there are no prices, how do we know what it is that consumers really want? And how do we know the value of resources, land, labor, capital, res raw materials? How do we know the value of all those factors of production in their alternative uses? So labor that is more valuable in making product X isn't wastefully misdirected to make a less valuable product, product Y. It is that fundamental economic rationality that is made possible through markets, competition, and prices. But under socialism, there is no markets because there's no private property. And there's therefore nothing to buy and sell. And there's no bargaining. And no bargaining results upon without, uh, and without bargaining, there's no prices. And without prices, we don't know what anything is worth. We don't know what consumers want. We don't know what resource values, uh, uh, what re value resources has in competing uses. There is total economic chaos. And that is what you saw and do see in these socialist countries. The fact is, is that the variety of goods, the quality of the goods, the quantities of the goods are far lower and less in Cuba than right here in the Bahamas. Because their economies are controlled. The government decides what gets produced. Is it being produced efficiently? How do you know? There's no prices to decide whether this was profitable or loss making. How do you know that this is the most valuable use for workers to be employed in producing product A instead of product B? We don't know, because there's no market determined wage where people say, I think his services are more valuable making a product that I think I can sell, as opposed to him there. We don't know that. Where is the competitive incentive to try to do this as efficiently as possible to make quality products that the consumers want? There's no concern with quality control in Cuba because there's no competition where if you don't like my quality of my product, you can go buy his because there is no one else to buy from. A dramatic case of this is that when I was in the Soviet Union in the last years of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s, <coughs> I went to what was like a showcase uh, a shopping mall in the Soviet Union. It was called GUM, G-U-M. And it is in Moscow, opposite the Kremlin, across Red Square. And uh, it was an old building dating from before the revolution. And it is, it is U-shaped, like this. And it has three levels. Level, okay, all the way around. So I, I, I was at one of my first trips to the Soviet Union, so I decided, you know, I'm walking through Red Square, gonna go see this, you know, the, the People's Shopping Mall. Okay, so I go in, the stores are empty. In some stores, there's nothing, or the poorest quantities and qualities of goods. Now, uh, remember, it's, it's sort of like a U-shaped like this, three levels. So I'm standing on the top level, right, the, the, the third level, on this wing. And I'm looking across, and on the second level, like just opposite, is a long line of women. What the hell is this? I mean, every other, every other store is like empty. <laughs> well, why this long line and women? I go around them, uh, women's underwear. Women's underwear store, long line, you know what? They're online, and what's available? One size fits all. Okay, comrade. Women's underwear doesn't fit, 
adjust with safety pin. <laughs> One size fits all. The worker's utopia, comrade. The worker's utopia. No wasteful duplication. Many sizes, many styles, many designs. No, One pe the people's underwear. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm not joking. Healthcare was the same. Healthcare was the same. Government ownership, providing of all healthcare, national healthcare in the Soviet Union. You go in for an operation, be sure that you have taken enough rubles, right? The, Russian, the Soviet and Russian currency. Make sure you've taken enough rubles to do what? Well, you know, you're, you've had the operation, you're lying in the bed, you can't move, and nature calls, right? You can't get yourself to the toilet, right? You better have enough rubles to bribe the nurse or the orderly to bring the bedpan. Because they're government employees, they don't care. They can't virtually, you know, they'd have to do something unbelievably crazy to be fired. And now you've used the bedpan for the purpose for which you required it. You better have a few more rubles or to pay the nurse or the orderly to take it away. Okay. You need an antibiotic? you better know how to go on the black market to buy it. Because in the plan, not enough of it has been produced, the government's central plan of production. But I can assure you there were the special clinics, the special hospitals reserved for the party officials. And they had plenty of the medicines, and if they didn't have Soviet versions of it, though those party officials and high pe people, uh, people high up in the bureaucracy they had access to the foreign imported pharmaceuticals. But the masses, you better know someone on the black market. As part of the central plan, they decided that it was not in the interests of you know, the, the, the nation's purpose to invest in contraceptives. Okay? So, no pill. Uh, no devices, and uh, if we can talk bluntly here, uh, prophylactics, right, condoms. I, I, I won't tell you what the qualities were, okay? But I'll just say this. The quality was such that men preferred not to use it if they wanted any feeling. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Can we talk? Can we talk? Okay. 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 Women, close your ears. This is just for the guys. Okay. Okay. Imagine having to use for this purpose something that would feel like a snow boot. Have a nice day. <laughs> uh, hey, I'm being honest here. This is the reality of their system. So, what was the method of birth control? Abortions. The average Soviet woman in her lifetime had somewhere between three and nine abortions. Now, think about this. It has, separate from the issue whether you think abortion should be legal, whether you think abortion should not be legal, think of this. Would this be the most preferred way of a woman practicing birth control? Would any of us feel this way? Of course not. And, did I add, going through the operation without anesthetic because that wasn't available under the plan either. Okay. My wife lived in this system her entire life. She knew, she, she, had, to, she had an operation once, an abdominal, abdominal problem. She, she went through these problems, bribing orderlies. She had friends who wanted to terminate a pregnancy. This was the way to do it, without, without anesthetics. This is, this is all, you know, the government decides what's available, including these things. This was a madhouse of everyday life. Let me tell you how people would shop. You know, we, we go shopping here, we take it for granted. We drive to the market, you know, and, 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 you know, and, and you know, the supermarket, you have, your, you know, you have your little cart, and you go down the aisles, and pick this and pick that, and, right? And then you go to the checkout counter. This is not how you shopped in the Soviet Union. 
No, according to the government's plan, comrade, the, it is better to have separate stores for each product. So you want bread, right? So how do you shop for bread? You go into the people's bread store. And you know what you do? You get on a line. And you wait. And you wait. And you wait. I experienced this. You wait. Now you get to the front of the line. And what is it is? You tell the woman behind the counter what you owe. A, 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 a loaf of rye bread, a, a pumpernickel, uh, assuming that they have any of it. Okay? <laughs> now she gives you this little ticket saying what how much bread you want in the types. Do you know what you do with a little ticket? You get on another, a second line. And you know what you do on this line? You wait, and you wait, and you wait. And you know what this second line leads to? The cash register where you pay for it. Now you've paid for the bread. You know what you do then? With your receipt, you go on to a third line. And you go and you wait, and you wait, and you wait. And then you get your bread. Oh, by the way, if there's any left by the time you've gone through the lines. <laughs> I'm not joking. Now, you've heard the phrase, man does not live by bread alone. What an idea. You want some, you want some butter and milk to go with the bread. But... And now you have to go to the People's Dairy Store, right? <laughs> the People's Dairy Store. Ah, oh, comrade, the people, it's all for you. And guess what, comrade? Dairy Store, not necessarily next door to Bread Store. So here you are in Moscow, we're talking about winter, right? You're trudging with your, ba your bags. Okay, and you get to the Dairy Store, and guess what you do in the Dairy Store for the milk and butter? Line one. Line two, line three. Well, there you are with your bread and your dairy products. And guess what? Well, your bread, you'd like some meat to put on the bread, right? A sandwich. Must go to people's meat store. Not next door to dairy store. So you are with your bags trudging to the meat store. And guess what? Line one, line two, line three. This is how people lived every day. Oh, and you know what? The, 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 these retail stores, such as for these food products, they have the same working hours as the government offices for other things. Like my, my wife was a senior researcher at the Soviet Academy of Science. So by the time they would finish their day at five o'clock, all these retail stores are shut, right? The people's, the people's workers must have their rest at five o'clock. So, how do you do your shopping when the time you get off at work, everything is shut down? So, you'd punch in, you know, like punch in the clock, right? You showed up at eight o'clock in the morning. And then, like in her case, the, the, one of the ladies' room was on the ground floor. So, sh as she would say, you'd go into the ladies' room, climb on top of the toilet, and sneak out the window at the, at the, at the, pay, at the uh, street level, and go out and do your shopping. And then after you'd done your shopping, waiting on lines, you'd come back through the, the, the bathroom window. <laughs> and then you'd give, and finish whatever time was left to do any of the work. Or as they would say in the Soviet Union, they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. Okay, they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. Okay? This was, this was, this was the, the, the nature of, of, of the system. Okay. Ah, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll tell a few. You know. yeah, one of the great things about the, of, of tyranny is that to release the tension, people have to have jokes. Okay? So, 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 so uh, w w w one of these jokes was that in the 1970s, the head of the Soviet Communist Party, a man named Leonid Brezhnev, is visiting a collective farm somewhere you know, in the rural areas of the Soviet Union. And as he comes to the entrance, of the collective farm, this little girl meets him with a bouquet of flowers. And Brezhnev is touched and, and he says, well, little girl, who is your mother? And the little girl says, well, comrade Brezhnev, my mother is the state. <laughs> Excellent little girl. And little girl, who is your father? Well, comrade Brezhnev, my father is the Communist Party. <laughs> Excellent little girl. And little girl, when you grow up, what do you want to be? Comrade Brezhnev, I want to be an orphan. <laughs> okay. One, one, one other, okay? One other, one other. Back in the 1960s and 1970s, there was a very famous Italian actress named Gina Lola Brigida. 
<laughs> so one day, Gina Lola Brigida in Italy gets this letter of invitation as a, to, for a formal visit to the Soviet Union. Now, Gina Lola Brigida is not particularly, you know, a communist or sympathetic, but a formal invitation. I mean, how do you turn this down? What an opportunity. So she flies off to Moscow. She's met at the airport, you know, the limousines. She's taken to the Kremlin, thinking there's going to be like this, you know, this big banquet dinner in her honor. So she arrives there, and there in the dining hall of the Kremlin, it's all set up for dinner, but the only person there is the head of the Communist Party, Leonid Brezhnev. They sit down to dinner, and they're eating their meal, and now it's, you know, you know, afterwards with liqueurs, and Brezhnev says to her, oh, Gina, Gina, I've loved you my entire life. I've seen every one of your movies seven times. From the, from the first p imagery of you on the screen, I, I just adored you. If you will go away with me to my country house outside of Moscow for one weekend and be mine, I will give you anything, anything you want. And she thinks for a minute and Gina Lola Bridges says, okay, I'll do it. I'll go away with you for a weekend at your, you know, your summer house. But I have one request, anything, you just name it, anything. And she says, I want you to eliminate all the border restrictions. People can freely leave and freely enter the Soviet Union. No more restraints on the free movement of people. And Brezhnev looks at her and says, Gina, I didn't realize that you're such a romantic. You want us to be alone. See, everybody will leave. Everybody will leave. They'll be alone. Pay attention. This could be on the test. <laughs> okay. One more. Okay. It's election time in the Soviet Union. And so some peasant comes in from a collective farm to the little town, and he holds his sealed ballot. And he's just about to push it, put, put it through you know, the slot in the box. And he hesitates. And he pulls it out again, and he starts opening the envelope. And this policeman comes up to him. In Russia, they're called militiamen. And, he say, and the militiaman says, Comrade, what are you doing? And the peasant says, Well, I'm merely just opening the envelope to check who I had voted for. And the militiaman says, oh, but comrade, this is a secret ballot. See, it's a secret <laughs> ballot. You don't get to see who you voted for. It's a secret ballot. That definitely would be on the test. Pay attention. <laughs> I mean, that, that was the reality of this system, OK? That was the reality of this system. Tragically. It's why, at, after these experiments with so socialism and government planning, it not only led to tyranny, but, but these, these terrible standards of living, of the unavailability of goods, the poor quality of goods, a mismatching of supply and demand. My wife, who had been married before, uh, when we got married, I, her daughter became my stepdaughter. When, when her daughter was a little girl, she waited online for three days to buy a pair of shoes for her daughter. Three days. With no certainty that when you got to the front of the line, there'd be any left in the size and style you needed for your child. So often you'd just buy any pair of shoes that was available to then trade you know, unofficially with someone who might have something else that you wanted. There's these huge black market activities for these reasons. That is another reason why socialism in the 20th century turned out to be a dead end, and why it still isn't a dead end in those residues of communist countries today like Cuba or North Korea or Vietnam and or many elements in China still. It's because it denies the ability of the person to be free because the government monopolizes the control of everything. And it results in such a poor quality of life because the very nature of their economic system does away with those market institutions that are the basis of creating self-interest, incentive, and information through prices for people to know how to coordinate with their actions with others through that Adam Smith invisible hand. Instead, you have the visible hand of government power and control with its negative effects. And that's why we are fortunate, I would like to think, that this great utopian experiment in building the socialist utopia paradises will, will now in the 21st century, I hope, remain a closed book that will never be tried again. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, why don't we take a few questions uh, and uh, then we'll see how the schedule is going, okay? Okay, yeah. I have a question. Sure. 
So with all due respect, sure. you have been listening to your, your presentation on, on socialism, communism. Yep. And for people that have never been exposed to that, never seen socialism, it's really not, not that bad. My wife is Cuban. I've been to Cuba any time. Right. And of course, there's some things you can't buy because of blockade, whatever reasons they put forth. But living here in the Bahamas, I'm Bahamian. If, if something's wrong with me in Cuba, at 12 o'clock in the night, I have a toothache. There is a dentist that I can see free of, of charge. Really? Uh, wh wh where did the government, how, how does the government pay the dentist? Is and it I'm free? Hold on. I'm, I'm, I, I, you know how the system works, and I can't level with you with a lot of things. Uh -huh. For education, you won't find under the age of 60, you won't find one illiterate person in Cuba. The Bahamas, we find them all over the place. <laughs> all over the place. You cannot go to a doctor here unless you have some serious money. You go to Princess Margaret Auckland, you die there. <laughs> in this country, in Cuba, that won't happen. Infant mortality rate. When a girl is pregnant, a doctor comes around you can see the doctor any time you want. They, they designated the signaries to come around. How's the house here? How's that? We had a problem with dengue the other day. A few they didn't know what to do in this country. It was in Cuba, they had a problem with dengue. They resolved that problem in one month. No more dengue. So the views that you present of socialism. I mean, 80 million, this, so many dying here, so many dying there. You live in a socialist state. There are people that, go, <coughs> that leave Cuba and go to the United States under the wet foot, dry foot policy. And they stay in Miami for a while. I met so many of them crying. They want to go back. They want to go back because it's impossible to make it in in a system like that. No schooling, no health care, no housing. And, you know, the socialist system has its merits also. So it's not like how you painted in, how it was in the Soviet Union. It needs to be adjusted. It takes time to work things out. They've had, they've had a half a century. Well, well, there's a blockade for how long to? Oh, they're gonna, they, you're gonna, first of all, I don't believe in the blockade, so that's a separate issue. So you're going to blame it on a blockade? Well, you can't. If I can get... They can trade with anyone else in the world. So just because you can't trade the United States... The United States owns everything. The United States does not own everything. Listen, there's some patents on some drugs and some things that they want, some pacemakers for the heart. And if they go there and if they want to buy it to Italy, it costs so much more. Okay, where does the where where does the Cuban where does the Cuban government get the resources and the money to provide these services? Russia. Well, no, no, you don't get anything from Russia. Oh, yes. Very little. They used to. They don't anymore. Okay, they have to tax their own people, don't they? Well, they have tourism. They've got a lot of. Tourism. Do they have to tax their own people? Everybody has to be taxed. Okay, so it's not free. I'm getting what the government chooses that I should have based upon the priorities the government gives it to it. I don't deny that there are health care and educational problems in a place like the Bahamas in the United States. I would argue that the educational and the health problems that are in the United States and likewise here in, in a place like the Bahamas is precisely because markets are not allowed to work. In the United States, doctors used to make house calls. In the United States, there used to not be one uniform price for all patients. Doctors would practice what the economist calls price discrimination. You'd pay your wealthier, you'd charge your wealthier payment, patients more and cross-subsidize your less wealthier, poor patients. All of that has been eliminated in the United States by government-mandated health care rules. You can only charge patients all one price. You can only give them one treatment. You have to go to these, to, to these, these government-funded and subsidized health, 
health establishments. So you've destroyed home visits in the United States, which existed under a freer health care system in the past before government started intruding. And there were incentives and motives for, medical doc for, doctor for people to go into medicine, to, to, to provide care to patients. It used to be the case doctors would work in rural areas. A rural family didn't have the money to pay because, you know, the treatment, their son got sick or something. You paid a chicken to the doctor. That's the way it used to be. But that isn't allowed in these types of, of, of systems that the government manages and controls it anymore. There, Obama is in, is, is in the process of implementing what will end up being a comprehensive national health care system in the United States managed and controlled by the government. I, I will make a c prediction, and I'm a person who never bets money, I'll bet money that 30 years from now, American quality health care will be less, the availability of health care will be reduced, there will be lines, and the government will decide who lives and dies. Because they'll decide, well, we have to decide the cost-benefit based upon tax revenues and expenses what services are worth to give to older people and whether it's really worth it given the cost of the system. I don't want a system in which the government determines whether my family lives or dies. I don't want the government deciding who, what doctor I go to or health care, what health treatment I can receive. I want to make these decisions my, for myself, either my, out of my own pocket directly or competitive insurance companies that I choose to contract with. The same way in the United States, I choose what insurance company is going to insure my car. I choose what insurance company is going to insure my house. I choose what insurance company is going to give me a life insurance policy so that if I die in an accident or something, some money will be left to my wife. I want these choices for myself. I don't want a Castro dictating my future. I don't want an Obama or a, or a Bush in the United States dictating my future. Who the hell is, is Fidel Castro to tell the entire population of Cuba how to live? We decide this is your health care. This is the work you'll have. This is the availability of goods in the store. This is the news you can have. This is what you can say or what will end you up in a prison. Who, what arrogance is this in, in Castro to say that he knows what is good for all the people of his country? Who made him God? Who made him God? And I will say that about all the politicians in my own country. Who the hell is Obama? Who's, Ob who, who's Bush? to have decided that he knows how to remake Iraq and invade a country. And who is Obama to say that he knows how to remake the medical system of the entire United States determining my family's medical future? The arrogance of these hubris of these people. Now, I, I, I know that I'm being very passionate here. I'm being very passionate here. But I consider that these are life and death issues. Are, do you believe in the dignity and freedom of a human being? Or are you going to say that another human being who puts his pants on the same way, has the same imperfect knowledge, imperfect emotions and feelings and, and, and temptations as the rest of us, is going to put himself in a political position of power and then tell the rest of us how to live? What is most flabbergasting is that we accept this. Okay. And I, uh, I apologize for my passion. No. <laughs> uh, let me get a hand back there, yeah. Um, it is said that a value that it talks encourages uh, big government. That um, encourages people to? It encourages big government. Uh -huh. um, how do you feel about that? And also, um, what type of taxation do you, would you recommend or would you agree that a government should impose on the people? Okay, um, the, 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 the danger that I see in, in, in a value-added tax is that it makes, a, it makes it increasingly difficult for the voters and the taxpayers to know exactly what products they're buying are really costing and what the burden of government is as a result of that. Because the value-added tax works that, you know, to make a product goes through various stages of production. We can think of it this way, you know, the tree is cut down in the forest. It's transported to the lumber mill. The lumber mill cuts up the, tr the, 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 the trunks of the trees into various forms. Some of my uh, might be the beams for a construction project. It's, it's sold to the construction company. They, they, build, they, they, they build the frame of, of what will be whatever building it is. 
and then it's finally sold to, to whoever buys the building, okay? So it has gone through various stages of production where, it's, where, where something is done and then sold to the next guy who does something and does the next step and, until finally it's bought by some consumer of some type. The, the difficulty of, of, of the value added tax is that each stage of these production processes is taxed. Like the good trans ta changes hands in a transaction leading to its further development to the finished form. And at each stage of this production process, the manufacturers and the sellers are paying a tax. And, and therefore, the tax is embedded through the entire production leading up to the finished product. And therefore, since it's embedded in this cost structure, it is more difficult for the consumers and the taxpayers to be able to distinguish what is the real value and cost of the product and how much has been added on as a tax burden. It, it hides the cost of government in this way. For example, in the United States, we, we have sales taxes. These are at state levels. There's no federal sales tax. But like in Michigan has if I'm a 6% sales tax. So I go in and I, and I, and I pay a dollar for something, okay? It's gonna be a dollar six cents at the cash register, okay? And so obviously if you're buying something like a refrigerator that's a couple of thousand dollars, that's 6% on top of that, you notice that. But you see, you know what the government is costing you. Because when, 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 when the product is scanned, you know, $10 plus the 6% sales tax. So it's clear to you, the con consumer, the citizen, and the taxpayer, how much the government is costing you at these retail levels. But when it's embedded through all the stages of production, the government could be changing the tax, raising the tax, and it's hard, it makes government less transparent. And certainly one of the elements of an open society is that we, the citizens, should know not only what the government is doing in terms of duties, functions, and responsibilities, which may be argued and disagreed about, but what it's costing us. And when it's embedded through the stages of production, you don't know whether it's just the normal cost of hiring workers and buying resources for that stage, or whether there's, and how much of a tax on it. So I, I consider it, uh, um, if you will, anti-democratic in that sense, because it, it hides something from the voter citizen. Um, and uh, so, so uh, what would be a preferable tax? Um, uh, well, let me go through several of these because, you know, it's, on the one hand, I, I'm not a fan of income tax because I believe that it has the tendency to undermine people's incentives to work, save, and invest. Because when the government can tax uh, a certain amount of each additional dollar you earn, the more it taxes a percentage of that dollar, the less incentive you have to earn that dollar. Um, but let me say this, if there was going to be, if there is going to be an income tax, I would prefer to see a flat tax rather than a progressive one, where the more you earn, the higher the tax. Um, because I believe that that undermines, again, people's incentive to want to earn more because, you're, because you get into the higher tax bracket and the government takes a larger take. I think that it would, if you're going to have income tax, it's better to have a flat income tax, like, like uh, the 10%. Now, that means rich people still pay more than a poor person. Because if I'm making a million dollars, 10% of a million dollars is more than 10% of $20,000 a year. You see what I'm saying? The rich person is still paying more. But you, it's, it's less negative in its effects on people's incentives to want to earn more through production and investment and so on. Uh, more profitable than, than that is that uh, some people have advocated there's a, a movement in the United States called the fair tax movement. And this is for neither, uh, neither form of a, an income tax, either progressive or flat, but a national sales tax. Uh, this means that it doesn't have a negative effect on um, people's willingness or ability to earn by taxing your income directly. Uh, it's not embedded in the production process like with the value added tax. And everybody would know what the government is costing them just because there's the price and then that's tagged on as a national sales tax. But I would only be for such uh, these types of reforms if, if, if the other taxes were abolished. I think it would be a disaster to have an income tax plus a national sales tax. You see what I'm saying? It should be a reform that you, you pick one and it's the one that's least, least intrusive into people's freedom of choice and their incentives to work and be productive. Yes. Professor, 
could a government like what we have in the Bahamas right. that um, um, leads more with divide and conquer, uh -huh. the masses, uneducated, ignorant, right. Right. and they do it for, for the purpose that um, they will remain in power. Right. Will that power be um, taken away if they were to educate the masses and um, empower them? That's, that's the question. Uh, the, 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 the most important thing is to get people to think differently about themselves and the society in which they live. And through changing how people think about themselves and the society in which they live, then at some point there occurs through that a change in the political system. See, uh, in the United States, I obviously have my political preferences. I'm not expecting anything to change in the next election. Because the politics of today reflects the current of opinions that were developing decades ago. You have to change the current of opinion, the people's values uh, about the social order and economics and politics and relationships between people be before you can bring about a change in the politics. It's sort of like, uh, if, you know, you, it, it's, it's sort of like religious conversion, if you will. You can try to control a person's external behavior, but you're not really going to change them unless you change them from within. A person has to change from within. And if you change from within, then your external conduct is going to naturally follow from that. Well, you won't see a change in politics, in my view, that is, who gets elected and what government does, until there's a change in people's judgments as about what they think is a good and moral society. If you believe that a good and moral society involves significant redistribution of wealth, the government determining what will be given to you through systems of planning, um, then that's one type of society you're going to have. If people believe that they should take more self-responsibility and make these decisions for themselves, and human relationships should not be based upon political coercion, but the free associations and exchanges of, of the marketplace, then that will generate a different change in society. So it's at the ideal level that, that, that the changes have to occur. Um, I actually will be talking a little bit about this in my last lecture tomorrow, um, in which I'll say, which partly of which I'll try to a answer the question, how do we bring about these changes, and, and where does it begin, and how does it develop? Um, because that's probably the most important question. Um, I'll, and, and, that, uh, and that applies regardless of where you strong s stand along a political spectrum. If you want to change the society in one direction or another direction, you ultimately have to start the trend of changing the ideas in the direction you prefer by changing people's beliefs and attitudes and values. And, and that's not an easy matter, but I'll try to touch a little bit upon that in my last lecture tomorrow. Thank you. Yes. Okay, I have a comment and a question. Sure. sure. The comment, the, the Cubans who went to the sure. United States sure. Sure. how he claims that probably, I mean that many of them complain about the conditions and would rather go back. Right. I don't think that's a testament on the economic system of America, but really the economic system of, in America towards immigrants who migrated from Cuba to America, not, right. not really, and, and their expectation probably was higher than what they received as immigrants in America, right. not really how citizens of America, of America is treated. Mm -hmm. But my question is this related to the fact, do you see any advantages, if, if any, to do a marginal benefit cost kind of analysis on it? Because you said that there's a cost Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As a negative effect of that. Right. But is there any advantages of having a bad tax in the bonds? Or in any economic system? Because Europe has it, many European countries have it, and it's working fine for them. It depends on what, see, uh, uh, in answering the question, like a uh, cost, you have to ask, how is it working for them? You know, what, what, what is it that, that the government has the tax to do? And basically, the tax has one function, to generate income for the government. Now, if your goal is to maximize revenue for the government, then they may decide that that's a good tax. But the problem with any tax, including a value-added tax, is that the more it's raised, the more expensive it comes for people to, to pay what that tax is, is, is costing you. And that can act as a disincentive and a difficulty of undertaking production and being able to afford to buy the finished product. So it can have negative effects on, on the productivity and the efficiency of the society in that way. Uh, it, it's, 
it, it, it's sort of like these issues now in Europe right now, and this affects some parts of the Caribbean too. Uh, you know, get rid of tax havens, right? Yeah, you know, big thing about Cyprus recently and stuff. I love tax havens. I, I, I may, may a thousand tax havens bloom. Okay. I love tax havens. And you see, you, you, you know why? You, you know why the European Union and the U.S. government doesn't like tax havens? Because people try to escape from their tax slavery, right? That's what. It, yeah, they. The, the, the president of France, right, Hollande, I mean, I find it a little strange. You know, in English, how would you pronounce his name? Holland, right, Hollande, the president of... How can France have a country, have a president named Holland? Does that mean that someday Holland will have a president named France? I don't understand this. It's too confusing for me. But anyway, so Hollande, I guess is how you pronounce it in French, Hollande, he has you know, this tax of 75% on the wealthy. They're now seeing an, a, a, a leaving of France, an exodus of, of famous actors and artists, of, of, of businessmen, right? And now he's shocked by this. People don't want to pay, say, oh my gosh, thank you, Alain. I'm going to be allowed to keep 25% of anything I earned. Oh, thank you, God. You're so good to me. I mean, you work for it. Don't but people want to keep more than 25% of their income. I mean, what a shocking idea. So where do they go? They move to residencies where they can pay lower taxes, or they put their money in these areas called tax havens. Okay, in, this in the case of one famous actor, he, he was given Russian citizenship by Putin, and now he only pays a flat 16% income tax, not 75%. Okay, so uh, that's why they hate these taxes. People are trying to escape from the tax oppression of their own governments. It's like safety valves, okay? Whereas I think tax havens, it's a way of a person being able to try to keep the income that they've earned. So they can use it productively to enjoy a better life for themselves. Save some money to leave to their kids. This is madness. 75% tax rates. Who, what happens to work incentives? Gee, I work to earn a dollar and the government lets me keep 25 cents. Boy, I'm going to go out and work more. So you have to look at these negative effects. Now, there is certainly a place in economic policy de de debate and discussion and argument for cost-benefit analyses. But it, it depends upon what do you view as working, successful, desirable in relation to these negatives. And uh, in, in, in my view, a, a VAT uh, is, is, is embedded in such a way that it's negative for me is that it just hides the tax burden from the citizenry and when raised increasingly, which it can be and has been, can act as disincentives on the productive ability of that country or that region like the European Union as such. So be a tax haven and keep those secrets. <laughs> yes. Um, in places where market fragmentation or scale cause issues with the distribution of and how does one reconcile a preference for free market alternatives with the ability of the state to provide cheap services of potential losses and first Well, okay, the, the, we have to remember, the, there was a French economist of the, of the uh, first half of the ni uh, uh, 19th century named Frederick Bastiat. You're getting a little book of his called The Law to Read. Uh, a little gift here. But he wrote an essay uh, called What is Seen and What is Not Seen. What is seen when the government does something? When the government, you know, wants to build a road or build a building or, or put people to work on a public works project, that's what you see. You see, oh look, it's a stimulus. The government has created road construction jobs. The government has built, built, you know, uh, you know, created you know, jobs in, the, in this type of you know, other public works or something. But Bastiat asks us to think about this. What is not seen? What is not seen? What is not seen is that where did the government get the money to undertake the bridge building or the road construction or whatever? It must have taxed the citizens of that country. Therefore, what is not seen? What is not seen is the things that private taxpayer citizens would have spent that money on if it had not been taxed away from them. He uses this example. 
uh, to sort of get the point. The, 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 R, the, the essay opens where some little street urchin, rascal, comes along and throws a brick through the window of a baker's shop. And the window pane is broken. And a crowd forms around, and at first they commiserate with the baker. Oh, how terrible, you know, children no longer have respect for private property, they break windows. Uh. But then someone decides to wax eloquent, you know, reflective in, in the crowd. Oh, yes, the misfortune of the baker is the good fortune of the, uh, of the window glazer, right? The guy who'll make the new pane of glass to, to replace the broken one. And he'll employ someone. See, so his misfortune creates work and jobs for somebody else. And now Bastiat says, but wait a second. What we see is that the window has been broken and, and someone will have to be employed in using labor and resources to replace the broken window. What is not seen? What is not seen is that if the window had not been broken, the money that the baker will have to pay to replace it would have remained in his pocket. And with the money having not had to be used to replace a broken window, he might have bought a second oven to increase his production of bread to sell to consumers. He might have been able to buy an additional coat for his wife or a new pair of shoes for his children. And that too would have generated employment for someone to build a second oven for him to have in the bakery or to manufacture the coat that his wife would buy or to produce the pair of shoes that his child would have, would have worn. All those are the productive alternative things that are not seen because the wealth and the income has been siphoned off through taxes and what you see is what the government spent it on. So when you talk about free health care, a free education, free this, free that, where has the government gotten the resources and the income to undertake these activities? They have extracted it from other members of the society through taxation. And what is not seen is the alternative productions, the alternative services, the alternative supplies that would have been created through the private sector if the wealth and the income had been left in the hands of the taxpayers instead of taken by the government. The alternative education, private education, the alternative private health care, the alternative private provision of various services in society, as well as the normal thing of ordinary private goods that we buy. That is what is not seen. And one has to appreciate these hidden costs of what is not seen in deciding what is r valuable and, and, and successful in terms of government taxing and spending. And also the issue related to what we talked about today is that how does the government know what to produce? In what quantities? With what qualities and features? How does the government know what a good education is? You know what a good pair of shoes is, don't you? You go into the shoe store, you try them on, you see if they're comfortable, the right size, if they're the style and fashion and the color you're interested in. You know what, what you're interested in a pair of clothes, don't you? You're looking for a jacket or a shirt or a pair of pants or whatever. And, and you look around to see who's offering it in the style, the features, the comfort, the, 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 the design you're interested in, in having, right? The mm -hmm. same thing with food. Some of us are vegetarians, some of us are meat eaters, some of us like to eat a lot of bread, others are watching their carbohydrates and eat less bread. So We find out what we want by searching in the market and people supplying them. The market responds to our demands. Now how do we know what education should be? The government monopolizes education. It siphons off our wealth to pay for it through taxes. We get what the government has decided is education from kindergarten through high school. Is this the best methods of teaching? Are these the best quality of teachers? Are these the curriculums that will lead people to successful careers or professions in later life? We don't know that because there's no alternatives. The government monopolizes it or so dominates it that it's very difficult for private alternatives to survive. But if education was private and competitive, the sellers of education would have to ask themselves the question, what is it that parents want for their children? What are young people looking for themselves when they reach a certain age? How do I demonstrate that the methods of teaching are interesting, successful, knowledge acquiring, as opposed to not, only, not, not just in relation to what the consumers say they want, but to do better than my, my rival competitive private school who's also trying to get that consumer's educational dollar. You create the discovery process of competition. 
Who can offer the best curriculum, the best teaching, te teaching methods to make it interesting and, and, and worthwhile in terms of actually what is learned? How, who can do it in offering these qualities, but at prices, competitive prices that different groups of people can afford? But we don't know this. Markets can provide that information. When the government does it, we don't have the answers. And now, having had food for thought, I think it's time to have food for other parts of ourselves. <laughs> and that's available out there. Thank you.